study the sixth chapter of Bhagavad Gita. It's called Dhyana Yoga or Yoga of Meditation where Lord Krishna will describe what is the nature of meditation, what is the object of meditation, what you meditate upon, how you meditate and what, are, what is the result of this meditation, all of this is the subject matter of the sixth chapter of Gita. <clears throat> Before that, we may have an overview of what has gone before in the earlier chapters. Uh, as you know, Bhagavad Gita is a dialogue between Lord Krishna and Arjuna, which dialogue took place in the midst of the battlefield and this dialogue became necessary because Arjuna requested Lord Krishna, please teach me, I am your disciple, I am surrendered to you, please teach me. Isn't it amazing that in the midst of battlefield somebody says, please teach me and Arjuna did not ask to be taught how to fight this battle. What should be the strategy? What weapons should I use? That was not his question. His question was a very fundamental question. Please teach me something about life. Please me teach me something about myself. He realized that he needed to know something in life. Perhaps he had not had an occasion to give thoughts to this. He reports to Lord Krishna, Karpanya dosho pahata suhava, tuchamitvam dharma samudha chetaha. O Lord, my suhava, my nature, has been overwhelmed by karpanya, by miserliness. O Lord, my nature has been, or my mind has been overwhelmed so right now you close your books because what you're just giving the background, so we'll come to the book when we'll study even verse each after the other, one after the other. <coughs> that my mind is overwhelmed by the defect of karpanyam or miserliness. Dharma Sammuda Chetaha, that my mind also is totally deluded with reference to dharma what is this reference to what my duty is? So these two questions or these two things arose in the mind of Arjuna. One, Arjuna said that my mind is overcome by this defect of miserliness. I have been a miser in my life, he says. In what sense? In the sense that I have been given this intellect Human being is gifted with intellect. Human being is gifted with a freedom of choice. And this freedom of choice and the intellect with which we know and learn and grow, this faculty is given for accomplishing a certain purpose. Someone was asking me the other day, Swami, what's the difference between human beings and animals, other living beings. The answer was that animals, if you see, that animals grow in the horizontal direction. Animals also have a brain. They also can think. They also have a mind. Except that their brain, their stomach and their sense organs, all of them are in the same line. Which means that their brain or the mind is used primarily 
to worry about the needs of the stomach and needs of the sense organs of perception, sense organs. Meaning that the life of all creatures other than human beings is devoted to simply fulfilling these natural needs of appeasing hunger and thirst, of protecting oneself, self-preservation and procreation. These are the natural instincts that all living beings have. And that's all that other life forms have. And there were, as we say, the other creatures, every creature is born with some intelligence. Every creature seems to know where to get its food from, where how to appease hunger, how to quench thirst, how to gain sense gratification. <coughs> with this kind of instinctive knowledge or awareness they are born. And with that they have finished a life. <coughs> That's all. That does not seem to be any other goal. They just come, live their life as prompted by their instincts and then they depart. Whereas human being is different. He grows vertically, not horizontally. Human being also has stomach. He also has sun's organs. And therefore, he also has needs to appease his hunger, satisfy his thirst. And there are the urges of gratification in the sense organs also. And therefore, there is a need of sense gratification as well. And so human being also possesses a mind or an intellect as to how to think of where satisfying his basic needs. But they say the human mind is on the highest level, highest place in the body. And therefore, not only the mind is capable of thinking how to fulfill this basic needs, but then the mind has much more capability. Mainly, human being is characterized by having a desire. There is always a desire to be different from what I am. Desire to be better than what I am. There are ambitions of becoming better and bigger and greater. So human being is born with desires, with ambitions. And he is also born with an intellect which is capable of fulfilling his ambition. So the mind desires, at the same time, the intellect has the capability of working out ways as to how to fulfill those desires. He is born with organs of action, hands, legs, speech. Therefore, if these desires can be put into action, thus he is capable of performing appropriate actions as planned by his intellect so that he can fulfill his desires. <clears throat> and that is why we see how human being has made a tremendous progress, you know, in every field. That is, because of his desire, because of his ambition, because of his intellect, because of his capacity to act. So human being is gifted with these three powers, the power to know, the power to desire, and the power to act. With intellect, he has the capacity to know new things and thus conquer new fields of knowledge. With the mind, he has desires with which he projects, he imagines, he visualizes, he dreams, he creates, and with his organs of action, the hands, legs, speech, etc., he acts, meaning that he performs actions to fulfill those desires. So human being is a very gifted being. He possesses gifts which are not available to any other living being. <clears throat> now when these special gifts are given, and another important gift is, as you said, the free will. The free will means the faculty of choice. He can choose how to use his intellect, how to use his mind, how to use the organs of action. Meaning, he can decide what to do, what not to do, why to do, all of this 
freedom he has. His life is not a programmed life as compared to the life of other creatures which seem to be programmed. And therefore, they live their life according to what is programmed. They do not seem to have a choice. Their choices are already made for them. Whereas, human beings have a choice in every situation. Free, free will. <coughs> now what happens is, when the freedom is given, then if the freedom is used judiciously, wisely, intelligently, then that freedom becomes a blessing to us. With the use of the freedom, we can grow, we can help ourselves, we can grow. If on the other hand, if the freedom is not used wisely, is not used intelligently, then an unintelligent use of freedom or abuse of freedom can also hurt the human being. This is a very unique thing. The free will is a great gift. At the same time, it also carries with it a responsibility. Freedom always carries with it a responsibility. Because that is called freedom which can be abused. And whenever we abuse the freedom, we are going to hurt ourselves and hurt others also. When we use properly, wisely our freedom, then we can help ourselves and help others also. So these are the possibilities in human life. The next question is, why is this freedom given to human being? Because as you say, human being also is born with an urge to become better and bigger than what he is. He is born with an urge. <coughs> as the Buddha Upanishad says, Asatoma Sadgamaya Tamasoma Jyotirgamaya Mrityorma Amritangamaya O Lord, please lead me from untruth to truth, from darkness to light, from death to immortality. So, he seems to be born with a desire to be immortal. He seems to be born with a desire. It's not that this desire is cultivated by us. We are born with desire. From darkness, from ignorance, he wants to be led to knowledge. From death to immortality. From untruth to truth. Which means that human being or human mind has a natural love for truth, has natural love for knowledge, has natural love for immortality. So whenever he finds that I am mortal, there is a desire to become free from mortality, to become immortal. Whenever he finds that I am ignorant, there is a desire to become free from ignorance to gain knowledge. Whenever he finds that I am in the realm of untruth, then there is a desire to reach or desire to achieve the truth. Thus, as I said, human being is born with this natural desire. <clears throat> Sat, Chit, Ananda. Sat means truth or existence. Chit means awareness or knowledge. Ananda means happiness or fullness. The human being wants existence. He loves existence. He loves knowledge or intelligence. He loves freedom, wholeness, completeness, happiness. This is what he loves. And therefore, he is always trying to achieve this goal that he loves. <coughs> therefore, human life has a purpose. And purpose is to fulfill this desire. That is, a desire behind all the desires. Even though we seem to be desiring different things, it looks as though different people are desiring different things. But if you analyze all the desires, then you find that the desire behind all the desires is for Sat, Chit, Ananda. Meaning that he wants to be there forever. He doesn't want any ignorance at all. He does not want death. He does not want unhappiness. He wants to be free from unhappiness or sorrow. He wants to be free from death. He wants to be free from ignorance. <coughs> so he finds himself. Human being is a self-conscious being. He is conscious of himself. He finds that I am bound. 
He finds that I am ignorant. He finds that I am subject to death. He finds that I am unhappy. It is not that other creatures are not unhappy, that they are not mortal, but then they do not seem to be aware of that. Meaning that it does not seem to bother them or they don't have the self-consciousness because of which they will be aware. And therefore, they seem to be merrily living their life, fulfilling whatever instincts or whatever desires arise in their mind. Whereas, human being has a very specific goal. Most human beings do not understand this. Most people do not understand that various desires which are arising in my mind have some fundamental uh, content in them. That every desire has a different form, but the content of desire is the same. And that ultimately, what I want is Satchit Ananda. I want existence. I want knowledge. I want enlightenment. I want happiness. I want wholeness. There is a desire behind all the desires. If a person recognizes this, and that calls for a certain emotional maturity, it calls for a certain disposition of mind. When the mind becomes contemplative, when the mind becomes thinking, then the person starts thinking about these fundamental things about life. The mind is thinking all right. But usually the mind only thinks of how to fulfill my desires. The mind thinks of what to do to fulfill my desires. How to become bigger and better and stuff like that. This is what the mind thinks. And never gives a thought, usually, that or never looks at this fact in life. That in spite of fulfilling so many desires, Still, I do not seem to be, I do not seem to have satisfaction with my life. I do not seem to have satisfaction with myself. Then in spite of fulfilling so many desires, the desirer does not seem to have gone. I still remain a desirer. And desirer means that a person is wanting or lacking within because every desire is an expression of an inner want or inner lack. And therefore, in spite of fulfilling these desires, in spite of accomplishing what all I have accomplished in my life, still, that lack or the want does not seem to have gone. I am still a wanting, lacking person. I am still dependent upon the mercy of the world to fulfill my desire, then alone I can be happy, otherwise I cannot be happy. Not only that, but even after a desire is fulfilled, I find myself happy for a little while. When that satisfaction of fulfilling desire is there, then my mind gets used to that also. And it finds no more much interest in that. It needs or it wants something else. This is the process going on with human being. But most human beings never give thought to what is happening to them. They just follow a pattern of life like everybody else follows. Like these lambs which simply follow one after the other. And the lamb that follows never thinks whether he can change the ways of the leading lamb. So whichever way the leading lamb goes, the sheep goes, in that direction he also goes. If there is a pit and the leading sheep falls down in the pit and jumps up again, everybody also will fall down and jump and never go around it. So also human mind is like this. He just does what everybody else does. There will be somebody because of the result of the past virtuous deeds. Because of the fructification of the punya karma, of the virtuous deeds, one may have performed in the past. Swamiji, is there a way? If this is so, then is there some provision in our life by which we can be made to think about life? Answer is yes, and that is what we call dharma, where a person leads 
द लाइफ ऑफ धर्म लीड्स द लाइफ ऑफ वर्च्यू लीड्स द लाइफ ऑफ वैल्यूज दिस इज वॉट द स्क्रिप्चर्स टीच स्क्रिप्चर स्क्रिप्चर्स रियलाइज दैट द ह्यूमन बींग नीड्स डिरेक्शन and that his ultimate goal is moksha or sachit anand but right away they will not tell you because the person is not mature enough to understand the value of that so the human being is they prescribe what we call the dharma or the, the duty the path of duty and path of values if a person does this If a person sincerely follows the duties, person tries to follow the values that brings about an inner growth, an inner purification, and a time comes when his mind becomes a contemplative mind, meaning that his likes and dislikes change. His mind, which was formerly always contemplating upon. how to acquire and how to achieve how to enjoy the new things the same mind now starts thinking about what are the things what's the nature of the world what's the, what am i doing here is the life is this life have a purpose and if so what's the purpose so this his mind becomes favorable to think about or contemplate upon these fundamental things this happens when that happens then the life takes a turn it is no more a life devoted to blind achievements and accomplishments so a blind fulfillment of desires it becomes now sort of a life wherein some understanding of maturity of what i'm seeking <clears throat> so this kind of a transformation has to happen in a human being when then arises a value for knowledge bhagavad gita shows in the first chapter of first chapter and the initial verse of second chapter how this transformation took place in arjuna when arjuna came to battlefield he also was like everybody else desiring victory desiring kingdom desiring everything that goes with kingdom in terms of power and the means of pleasure all of that is go with the kingdom he had the desire for them he came to battle for desiring those things but then something happened when he discovered that both the armies are both the armies consist of my near and dear ones that is when his mind which fell into sadness or grief nevertheless started thinking so arjuna felt highly grieved he felt extremely sad at the at the possibility of death of this near and dear ones also in the possibility of his being their killer all of this pained him deeply but in that painful situation in that state of mind which was suffering from grief or sadness somehow he started thinking and he seemed to gain some fundamental insights about life arjuna gained some fundamental insights he says to lord krishna na kankshe vijayam krishna na cha rajyam sukhani cha oh lord i do not desire victory I do not desire kingdom. I do not desire means of pleasure. Kinnu rajya ne Govinda kim bhoge hi jivit ne va. Oh Lord, what is there in kingdom? What is there in all these pleasures? What is there even in long life? What is there? When he asks this question, it means that he recognizes that these things are there, but then they have a very limited usefulness in the life. victory kingdom pleasures means of happiness resources all of these are required but they have a limited usefulness in life their means and they are not the ends so far he thought they are the ends when you achieve them then you gain success in your life today you discover that they are not ends they are means to something else 
that in fact what the mind is seeking is something else. And so he says to Lord Krishna, I do not want this achievement. He recognizes their limitations. In fact, he says to the extent, he goes to the extent of saying, Nahi prapashyami mama panudyat yachoka mucho shunam indriyana. Oh Lord, this pain that I'm feeling in my heart, in my sense organs, this burning that I have, the pain, the grief that I have in my mind, and my body, in my sense organs. I do not think that it will go away even if I get the unrivaled kingdom of the whole universe. So, asapatnam rajyam, even if I get the unrivaled kingdom. Not only that, but even if I gain the overlordship of the heavens. Meaning that, even if I become the lord of all the three worlds, I do not see how that achievement also will be able to remove this pain, this grief, or the sorrow that I'm suffering from. The great insight. You could see that no achievement, however great it is, can remove his sorrow. So normally a human being feels that sorrow is due because he doesn't have something. Normally a person thinks that because I don't have enough money, therefore I'm not happy. Because I do not have power or recognition, therefore I'm unhappy. Therefore, usually people associate their sense of lack or want or unhappiness with not having, because of not possessing something. Therefore, they go after that. Or sometimes we think that I'm unhappy because I have something. We need to get rid of that. So raga and dvesha, attachment and aversion. When I feel that my unhappiness is due to something, then I I have aversion for that. If I think that something will give me happiness, there is an attachment, and thus human being usually is propelled by the attachments and aversions. Keeps on fulfilling them. But here, I do not recognize that in spite of, even if I fulfill all my desires, even if I have the highest achievement in my life, and still, I don't think that I will be free from this sadness or unhappiness or grief. This is a great insight in life. To recognize that the cause of sorrow lies not in the world somewhere. It is not because some people are what they are, some situations are what they are, or whatever conditions around me are, I think that they are the cause of my sorrow, but recognition that that is not where the cause is. Cause is something more fundamental. The cause of sorrow is within me. And the people and situations only become occasions to trigger some buttons by which that sorrow which is there embedded within me, it just comes to surface. It is not even that sorrow is created, it is always there. It just becomes manifest. Like in a puddle of water, there is this mud underneath and it is covered with water. So it looks very clean. When you throw a pebble, how that mud comes to surface. And so also, my mind will look all right, but when a pebble is thrown, when somebody insults me, somebody rejects me, whatever, then that is like a pebble. And it brings to surface the sadness or unhappiness which is already there. <clears throat> Not recognizing, I think that the cause of sadness is the behavior of this person. Cause of sadness because I could not get a given thing. Cause of sadness is because I got something, whatever. Not recognizing that they are just the triggering points. They just push some buttons and what is within just comes to surface. Arjuna could see that. Arjuna could see that no achievement in life will be able to really remove that pain or sorrow. And that is how he submitted himself to Lord Krishna. He says, Karpanya dosho pahatasvabhava. 
my subhav on nature has been overwhelmed by this defect of karpanya or miserliness. Meaning that I have not used my intellect and thinking capacity for what it should have been used. I used it merely to fulfill my desires. I used it merely to achieve all the various material ends, thinking that they will give me fulfillment. I have not used it to think about the fundamental things about the life. I have not used it to recognize that there is some more fundamental problem. And because of that, Dharma Sammurajeta, because of that, my mind is deluded with reference to what is my duty, what I should do, what I should not do. <coughs> Arjuna thus expresses in a way two sets of problems that every human being has. One is what we call a phenomenal problem, other is what we call a situational problem. A phenomenal problem of sadness or grief that arises on account of ignorance, of not knowing something, of not knowing really the true nature of myself, of not knowing the truth of the reality, that's a fundamental problem, which everybody has in common. And it is this fundamental problem that gives rise to what we call situational problems. The situations become overwhelming. Situations become causing pain, sorrow, all kinds of things, meaning that these situations become capable of creating sorrow in me. Because already that fundamental difficulty is there. As I said, already the potential of sorrow is there. That is how the situation becomes capable of causing sorrow. If on the other hand that potential is removed, regardless of what the situation is, nothing can happen. When you are taking pictures with a camera, as you click the camera, the shutter is open, it is exposed to a certain scene, and that scene is able to create impressions on the film. That's how you get a picture. Meaning that every scene outside seems to have the ability to affect that film and create its impressions. It's not only the external scene that is involved in that, but the film also participates. It is a combination of the external scene as well as the characters of film. A combination of this, in fact, creates that impression called picture. Suppose, instead of this film, which is coated with a chemical coating. Suppose you fill this camera with a plain roll of paper, suppose. And then you click, and then the shutter is open, the same objects are there outside, but there is no impression, because the paper does not cooperate. So understand that when our mind becomes affected by what is happening around, not only that is responsible, but then we also cooperate because there is something in our mind which t- causes us to become sad. Remove that coating, doesn't matter what the outside world is. Remove the coating from our mind also, doesn't matter what the outside situations are, they need not affect us. So that coating is called ignorance. It is ignorance that causes sense of ego, sense of smallness. Ahankara, Mamakara, sense of ownership, Raga, Dvesha, attachments, aversions, all of these are there in our mind. They are comparable to the coating on the film. And that is why there is this reaction in the form of sorrow or sadness. <coughs> and therefore, what an ordinary human being does is he changes the world around. Thinking that the world is causing me unhappiness, therefore by changing the world or environment, I'll become happy. That I don't have a big enough house, if I get a bigger house, I'll be happy. My car is not good enough, you get a better car, I'll be happy. And whatever, thinking that 
he, he keeps on rearranging the environment around him, hoping that, that that's how he becomes happy, keeping himself intact, not bringing any phenomenal change in himself. And therefore, the sorrow seems to keep on coming back again and again and again. Seems to go away momentarily, comes back. <coughs> that's what Arjuna recognized today, winning the battlefield. And that's how he appealed to Lord Krishna to help him. Oh Lord, there is some fundamental situation in me, there is some ignorance in my life. And therefore, yes, Shreyasyat, Nishchitam Bruhitan me, please teach me that, by which I, am, I can become free from sorrow once and for all. I can become happy once and for all. So far I know, happiness comes and goes. There is no abiding happiness. There is no lasting happiness. There are only spurts of happiness and generally there is unhappiness or sorrow. In between, there are spurts of happiness. <clears throat> I want happiness that comes and never goes. I want happiness to come and never go. I want unhappiness to go and never come. <clears throat> this is called Nishtam Shreya, Nishreya sir, which is what Vedanta calls Moksha or liberation. So what is Vedanta's definition of moksha, attainment of happiness, unsurpassable happiness, and elimination of unhappiness once and for all. And therefore, elimination of sorrow or unhappiness once and for all, and attainment of happiness once and for all. That's called sorrow, I mean that's called moksha. And that's what human being wants. Today Arjuna recognized that that's what he wants. So far he did. He was, you know, happy now and then, then everybody else is. <clears throat> but that basically was unhappy, punctuated by some spurs of happiness. He realized that what I want is happiness that is unconditional, that does not depend upon anything, that's not created. Whatever is created is going to perish, and therefore uncreated, that which is natural or spontaneous, that's what I want. <coughs> shishya stayam sadhimanam tam prapannam O Lord, I am a shishya, I am your disciple. I am surrendered to you. Please teach me. So this is how the, the occasion for teaching Bhagavad Gita arose in the midst of battlefield. That's the uniqueness of the scripture that has been taught in the midst of battlefield, where battlefield symbolizes the various conflicts and challenges that a human being is required to face. Now it's a very practical or a pragmatic scripture. It doesn't talk of any heavens, doesn't talk of other worldly things. It talks of our life, which is full of conflicts and challenges, and how to deal with those things. That is why perhaps there is no scripture like Bhagavad Gita which can touch the heart of human being if you understand it. <clears throat> and the Lord Krishna proceeds to teach Arjuna. That is what we call is Bhagavad Gita. And so uh, we will continue our discussion in the next class and give you some basic ideas of what has gone by up to the five chapters and then continue with the, start with the sixth chapter later. Om Purnamadaf Purnamidam Purnat Purnamudachyate Purnasya Purnamadaya Purnameva Vashishyate Om Shanti 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 Shankaram Shankaracharyam Keshavam Badarayanam Sutra Bhashyakruta Vande Bhagavanta Punaf Punaham Ishvaro Guru Ratmedi Murti Bheda Vibhagine Vyoma Vadvyapta Dehaya Dakshina Murtae Namaha Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Shri Guru Bhyo Namaha Hari Om